It is just so good to see everybody once again. If you logged in and we left you, the camera froze. So we're coming back on uh, live to you again. And we're saying good evening to you from wherever you may be tonight. And I know a lot of folks uh, have stayed home tonight, not feeling 100%. Uh, under the weather or just plain tired and we understand that and we're just so glad that you could join us uh, as we come to you um, live from Bethel Church here in Houston. We got a beautiful uh, live congregation tonight but we're so glad uh, that you joined us as well and so uh, brother uh, or sister Crystal wrote there's no sound so y'all let me know uh, if you're still having issues and uh, while we do this I would love for my wife to send my son over here uh, for just a minute. Bub, come here. Can you still, can you hear us yet, Sister Crystal? Say yes if you can. Come on, Bub. You can come too, Sister. Come here, buddy. Oh, you're getting heavy, Bub. You coming? Okay, you'll sit right there. I wanted to take a, a minute tonight, you may not know this, but today is a special day, and my boy is six years old today, and I love this guy, I'm so proud of him. Do you want to say something to everybody watching online? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for what? Everything you do. Oh, thank you for everything you do. Well, I wanted to, I, I was just hoping that um, here in the sanctuary and at home, that we could just take just a minute and uh, just sing a little happy birthday to, to uh, my favorite little guy here. And uh, help me tonight, if you will. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Isaac. Happy birthday to you. And many more. I love you. Do you want to teach tonight? What would you teach about? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Well, then go on. Happy birthday, bub. Will y'all give him one more hand? Amen. Sister, it's not your birthday. Go with mama. Well, thank you for singing to my boy. I'm proud of him. Six years. When we first came to Bethel, he was one year old. So what a, what a, what a ride it's been. He wasn't one yet. He turned one that, that December. So when we came, we came here September 5th was our first service, and he turned one in December, December 9th. So uh, we, we just appreciate you guys, and, uh, and we love you so much. Thank you for loving our kids. And uh, we just wanted to say happy birthday to my buddy Isaac. Let me just take just a minute to tell you if you'd like to give tonight, if you're here live in the sanctuary, of course you know. That when you leave tonight, there will be a bucket there in the foyer, and um, you can just drop your tithe and your offering in there, and we really appreciate your giving. If you'd like to give online, you'll see right below me, there is a telephone number, which is 715-803-4772. And if you type that into your text messages, and you type the number 1268773, then uh, it will send you a secure link that... Uh, you can uh, donate, give to the church, send your tithe in, or whatever you would like to do. If you don't want to give that way, you can go on PayPal, and we are at Bethel PCG on PayPal. If you'd like to give securely that way, you can also just mail it in. Our address here, 2414 Lauder Road. We uh, check the mail uh, every day, either myself or Pastor Dave, and uh, you can do that as well. Or you can go on our website which is uh, BethelChurchHouston.com, and give that way. Now, folks have been given, um, over the last month, we have seen an enormous increase uh, in online giving, uh, even from folks that do not even attend church here in the regular sense. That's the interesting thing about what's happening right now in the world is we're starting to see people that say they attend your church and <laughs> You know, they live in other states, but they're attending online. And it's going to be the new reality of the church. It really is. And so uh, we welcome everybody watching uh, online tonight. I see already a huge, uh, a huge crowd that we have tonight watching online. We say hello to Sister Norma. We prayed for you tonight. Sister Martha, we prayed for you. And Brother Bobby, Sister Alicia told me you weren't feeling 100% tonight and uh, that you sounded like I did last week. So if it's my fault... 
I'm sorry. I love you. And uh, praying for you to get uh, better. Uh, and uh, we prayed for Sister Crystal tonight, and she's online with us. And uh, also Mary Richter. Good to see uh, you tonight. Let me mention one thing really quickly, if you don't mind, and then we'll get into the word. And uh, this is something that Sister Alicia um, reminded me that I needed to announce. We have... Um, we have decided for Christmas, there, there's a, a few uh, kids in our church that um, we really want to step up and help. Uh, otherwise, um, they may not have a Christmas at all. So we're going to adopt some families, uh, some kids. We're going to adopt some kids uh, for Christmas. And if you would like to help with that, whether it's you go by, we already have a list of what they uh, ask for um, and Sister Alicia can get that for you, or you can just say, hey, here's some, here's some money, and um, I want you to go get something for those kids. H how many are we, babe? I know at least, uh, I think there's six, right? Yeah, and then we also were approached by uh, the Dream Center. You probably remember me talking about the Dream Center a few weeks ago when they donated some food to us for Thanksgiving and we were able to bless a lot of families with that and so they came back to us here last week or maybe they called me probably Monday and uh, asked if uh, if we could help sponsor a kid so we are going to uh, sponsor another kid through them so over the next few weeks uh, if the Lord lays it on your heart you can contact us and I can give you an item that you can go pick up for a kid or if uh, you just want to say here um, here's a little donation. I think uh, Sister Alicia and Sister Christina Misho, uh, Sister Christina hit us up and Brother Scott tonight. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but they wanted to help um, a family. And they didn't even know yet, because I haven't announced it, that we had some families in need. And so Sister Christina and my wife are going to go shopping. Doesn't it sound like a terrible thing, ladies? They're going to go shopping on Monday. So if you'd like to give and you'd like to help, then uh, then we certainly would appreciate that. Uh, just looking at a message right now that says, uh, Corey needs your prayers tonight. He is battling some depression tonight. Well, let's do this. Uh, that's important. So let's just take a moment. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Corey, right now, I know you're watching, and, uh, and, and we love you, ma'am, and we're right here with you. Uh, the Lord's not going to leave you or forsake you, and neither are we, man. And so let's pray for our brother right now uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we come to you right now for my friend, God, and for a man that we love so much, a man, God, that offers a lot to the kingdom. He offers a lot, Lord, to this church. He means a lot to his wife and his family. And I pray, Lord, right now, God, that the things that are coming against him, Lord, we stand against that in the name of Jesus. I know, Lord, when it's a, an attack of the enemy that tries to get in our minds, and I just rebuke that right now. I pray for peace in my friend. I pray for comfort in my friend. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uplift his spirits. Uh, Lord, and I thank you for being with him tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. <coughs> Excuse me tonight. Corey, we love you, man. We're praying for you. Reach out to me, and I'll reach out to you as well. Uh, I'll hit you up and, and uh, check in on you. Uh, so we're glad to see everybody tonight, glad that everybody is here online and also here in person. And uh, I told you Sunday we were going to talk about Matthew chapter 1. So if you want to turn over there really quickly, we're going to just really quickly read through uh, kind of what we read through uh, last week really quick. And then we'll get into the four ladies that are mentioned uh, in this particular passage of scripture. And so uh, it'll come up on the screen. We'll go Matthew chapter 1. And uh, verse number one, it says, this is a record uh, of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah. For some reason, uh, let me get this up here for you. And Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's going to be important in just a minute. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amenadab. Amenadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of, 
how would you say that? Salmon or salmon? Salmon, <laughs> so, so, so yeah. Um, so what, what do you think, Brother Taylor, on that one? Would you say salmon, salmon, sa salmon, salmon? That sounds more biblical, doesn't it, salmon? Uh, he was the father of Boaz, <laughs> whose mother was Rahab. Uh, Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of uh, Jehoiachin and his brothers born at the time of exile to Babylon. And after the Babylonian exile, Jehoiachin was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of uh, Abiud. Abiud was the father of Elakim. Uh, Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Akim. Akim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of uh, Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Mathon. Mathon was the father of Jacob. And verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Look at verse 17, all those listed above. Include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. What a, what a passage of scripture. And if your eyes didn't glass over from uh, reading all of that, I'm proud of you. A lot of times we can get caught up in the uh, names and let it frustrate us. Some people may just even close their Bible because they don't see the importance of it and they don't see why, uh, why we need to read this scripture. But I talked to you last week. I told you a few things about why I believe this passage is important today. Remember, number one, it established Jesus as uh, part of the royal family of David. And we know that was a prerequisite that was foreshadowed. That was a prophecy being fulfilled that the Messiah would come from the bloodline of David, so this does that. Number two, it demonstrates that Jesus Christ had historical roots. He didn't just pop out of thin air, but that he came down as a man, uh, as a baby born of a virgin, who then grew up uh, just like uh, you and I did, although he was sinless, right, and perfect and blameless, but it just shows that he came down and took the place of all mankind. Uh, by going to the cross for us uh, and then number three and what we talked about for quite a while last week to me it was a chronicle of the grace of God meaning uh, it just shows how wonderful God is and there's a lot of people mentioned in this passage of scripture we talked about the fact that there's not many saints that you read about when you read this lineage of Jesus some there uh, were murderers, some on that list were fornicators, some on that list were adulterers, there were liars on that list, deceivers on that list, and think about that, most of the men mentioned, they were very great sinners, and that didn't even cover the four women that we mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. So it, inclu it included uh, in this list four unusual women, and uh, I believe that that's in itself unusual because typically when Jews did a genealogical record, females were nowhere to be found. They just weren't on it. We know in biblical times, and, uh, and thank the Lord, thank the Lord it's a new day, right, ladies? And, uh, and I believe in the church world today that women are now receiving the respect uh, that they deserve. Um, and, but in biblical times, you know, um, the, women's, the woman's place was not prominent. And it's the same when we're talking about the genealogical 
uh, records of that. So we look at these four women just really quickly, and I'm seeing folks joining us uh, from all over the state. Hey, Tommy Montgomery, love you. Glad you're here with us from Corsicana, uh, actually from Purden, Texas. We're glad he's with us and, uh, and appreciate you guys as well. But let's look at this. Um, let's look at these characters. The four women that were included in the family tree of Matthew 1, they were Tamar in verse 3, Rahab verse 5. Uh, what was that, verse 5? Uh, either way, let me say this. It, it was Tamar, it was Rahab, it was Ruth, and it was Bathsheba. And all of them were very unlikely people. And with the exception of Ruth, really, none of them possessed a character that you would be proud of. So let's just break them down really quickly while we have just a few minutes. And let's go to Tamar. Now, her story, which is unknown most to us, uh, unknown to most of us, it's found in Genesis chapter 38. So if you wanted to, after today, we're not going to take the time to read that. But if you want to write that by her name in Matthew chapter 1, you can write Genesis 38. And you can read all about Tamar. And it's a, it really is a sickening it's a sickening passage of scripture and a sickening story. Let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Judah was the son of Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham. And all you need to know about this story, really, is that Judah had a son named Ur, E-R. And Ur married a Gentile woman named Tamar. Now, Ur died, and uh, in biblical times, when a man died, it was the responsibility of the brother to come and to take care of, uh, of, the, of the wife. So he was doing his brotherly duty by marrying Tamar. But he, too, excuse me, I got to cough just a second. He, too, he, uh, he suddenly died. So now Tamar was not only husbandless, but now she was childless. And in biblical times, I, I know everybody here tonight, and if you're watching on the live stream, you probably know, that was like a, a double curse. It really was in, in, in biblical times. So because she was so impatient, and because she was unwilling to wait for God to supply her need, she came up with a plan. And she said, you know what, I'm going to cause my father-in-law judah i'm going to cause him to sleep with me and here was her plan it was a simple plan you can read this all in genesis 38 she dressed up as a prostitute and uh, she hung out outside of the gate there dressed up as a prostitute judah walked by i guess he liked what he saw i don't know uh and And he was in pain, too. He was in pain, too. Sister Alicia, you can't hear, but she said he was in pain. And um, so he takes, Judah takes Tamar and, and goes to, to bed with her. And I'll keep it uh, rated G since I know my kids, well, they're not listening anyways. They're playing games or something. Uh, I got to tell this story real quick. We were on the phone on the way here with Alicia's dad, and he said, are y'all going to church? And uh, I said, yeah, we're going to church. And from the back seat, uh, Olivia said, boring. <laughs> is, that, is that a preacher's kid for you? So uh, boring. That's exactly what she said. So, um, so she dressed up as a prostitute. She seduced Judah into sleeping with her. And she became pregnant. She gave birth to twin boys, which were Perez and Zerah. And when she confronted Judah with the truth, he said, uh, she is more righteous than I. That's what Judah said. Indeed, no one looks good in this story. There's no one in this story looks good. It reeks of greed and it reeks of deception uh, and it reeks of illegitimacy. It reeks of prostitution and sexual lust uh, and even reeks of a hint of incest. So whatever you can say about Judah, and it's not very good, you cannot by any stretch of the imagination say that Tamar was much better, if at all. You can't make her look good in this. Uh, what she did was evil. It was wrong. It was immoral. And she truly acted like a prostitute, even if she was not one by trade. 
And do you know that's really all we know about her? I wish I could tell you that, well, I guess there is a happy ending. Go ahead, honey. She was wronged, so she wronged him, is what I was saying. She, um, Judah, was supposed to give her his last son, mm-hmm. and he didn't want to give her his last son. He didn't son. follow with, and Sister Martha said that. I know you can't see that, babe, mm-hmm. but Sister Martha just wrote that in the comments. Judah did not follow the custom of that time and let his other son marry her, which is true. Right. So she felt slighted. Go so, ahead. She felt so wronged. So she felt wronged, and so she wanted to make him stumble. I feel like, and so yeah. it's kind of that saying is two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah, thank you, honey. That's excellent and a great point. Uh, anybody else want to comment on, on this particular? If, you, if you've never read this, and this is for you guys watching online as well, um, Sister Martha says, I disagree. Judah did not the custom. I don't know, Sister Martha, explain what you're meaning there. And I'll read it here in just a minute. But if you haven't read this passage of Scripture, again, go to Genesis 38 uh, and, uh, and make sure that you read up on that. Um, it, but but, but we, we come back to, is there a happy ending to this story? With her particularly, no. I mean, we don't see a, a happy ending. We see deception. We see prostitution. We see uh, evilness, right? But what we know is who came out of that bloodline? Jesus, right? And again, it gives us hope. And we talked about this last week. It gives us hope in knowing that, hey, no matter what's happened uh, in the past and and what's going on, um, if the Lord has a bloodline like this, then maybe I'm in decent shape. You know, there used to be a song, and it was uh, by a man named Hank Williams. uh, And I believe it was Hank Williams Jr. Uh, It was Hank Williams Jr., no doubt. And uh, he sang a song, and he said, um, we're just carrying on an old family tradition. And the song went on and talked about how, you know, they would drink, and they would smoke, and they would party all night. And the, and the verse, and the course of the song is, um, just leave us alone, leave us alone, we're carrying on a family tradition. And, uh, and, and you know, I began to think about that, and I, and I wrote this in the Facebook uh, uh, version tonight that we don't have to carry on that family tradition. May- maybe your family does have a history of that. Maybe you do have a history of alcoholism in your family or drug addiction in your family or uh, anger problems in your family. Let's just, you know, bring, bring, it, bring it around to real things that we deal with, you know, on a day-to-day basis. But we don't have to follow in line just because it's a family tradition. And uh, I think it's important to remember that. Anybody else want to comment on Tamar or online? Uh, Sister Martha said, Judah did not follow the custom, and she wanted a child from her husband's family. It was an inheritance thing or a custom of the time. Yes, we agree with that, Sister Martha. Maybe the microphone cut out or something, but we do agree with what you're saying 100%. She didn't follow... um, Judah did not follow the custom. Yeah. And 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 the other son should have been offered. Yeah. Yeah. I think y'all are saying the same thing. I think y'all can text each other later and uh, and chat about that, which is a good thing. We should always chat. Yes, yeah, Sister Taylor, please. Well, I, you know, I, I don't. Go ahead, Brother Taylor. Your thoughts on that? I don't. And Sister Taylor asked, was his age the only thing that precluded Judah from offering the third son? I think part of the other it son was was his age, but I think the other part was there's there's already been two sons that he'd lost right. with her, so I'm not going to give him my last son. Yeah, she's like the Black Widow. Son. Yeah, so uh, we used to tease my grandmother when she was alive that she put three of them in the ground. You know, we would tease her, and but but this probably wasn't a teasing thing. You know, my grandmother, 
Uh, her first husband she buried, her second husband she buried, and her third husband she buried. So we used to tease her and tell her, that's probably why you're still single, right? Uh, same kind of situation, and I think Brother Taylor is right. Not only was it an age issue, but hey, you've already killed two of my sons, right? So you're not getting the third one. It's very possible. Go ahead, Sister Taylor. Well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, she didn't technically kill him. I, I, I don't mean it in that way. Let's just be clear, though, because there may be people that have never read uh, Genesis chapter 38, but you should read it. It's an interesting story. She didn't. Yeah. Yeah, so she didn't, she didn't actually technically kill them. I was just joking around a little bit. But, um, so that, that, that's one, one of the ladies that's mentioned, Tamar. Let's go to the second lady that's mentioned, and her name is Rahab. I know that um, most of you probably know the story of Rahab. Um, she's almost always mentioned by a certain phrase in the Bible, a phrase that most of us know by heart, Rahab, the harlot, right? Um, but she was also a Canaanite, an enemy of the Israelites, and According to scripture, you could argue that the best thing she ever did was what? And what, and uh, Sister uh, Joanne said, hide those guys, but what did she have to do to hide them? She had to lie. So you could technically say that this woman, the best thing she ever did, someone in the bloodline of Jesus, the best thing she ever did was lie. You got to think about that and understand that a harlot, a Canaanite and a liar. And you wouldn't you wouldn't think she would have had much much chance of making the list in the genealogy of Jesus. But there she is. And her story is tied in with the larger story of Joshua's conquest of the walled city of Jericho. And when Joshua sent spies into the city, as Sister Joanne just said, Rahab hid them in her house and in exchange for safe passage out of the city, they promised to spare her and her household when the invasion took place. All she had to do was hang a scarlet cord from her window, and that would signify to those that were coming to take over the city that her house was not to be touched. So she agreed. She hid the spies. And when the king of Jericho sent messengers asking her to bring out the men, right? Because... Let's just be real. A lot of men went in and out of there. But they weren't looking for just any men, right? So they said, send out the men that you're hiding. She lied. She said they've already left the city, even though they were hiding on a roof behind. I'm sorry, Brother Taylor. Yeah, yeah, maybe hurry on out of here and, and, and you can catch them. They just left. But they were up hiding on the roof behind some flax. And... uh she let the men out the window with a rope, and uh, they returned to Joshua. It's a great story with a lot of lessons, but we can't miss the point that Rahab was a harlot. That was her trade. She was a prostitute. The men hid there because people were going to be accustomed to strangers going in and out of her house at all hours of the night. They would have thought nothing of it. Oh, well, there's just some more men going in there. It's kind of like uh, today's day and age where when we see crack houses around and you know something's going on in that house, right? So you don't ever trip out in your mind when you see cars coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Same kind of deal. And uh, so we can't deny the fact that Rahab, not only was she a prostitute, but she told a bald-faced lie. Is there anything good we can say about her? Well, yeah, she was a woman of faith. You don't have to take my word for it. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, you see this scripture by faith, Rahab, right? That's what Hebrews 11 31 says. So her lie was motivated by her faith. It's not a practice that I would condone or tell anybody to participate in. It was by faith that she hit him, Brother Taylor said, and I, I agree with that. <clears throat> and when the invasion came, she was spared and in the course of time be, uh, became the great-great-grandmother of King David. 
a prostitute, a Canaanite, and a liar, but also a woman of faith. And she became the great-great-grandmother of King David. And she made the list. And she's a part of the family tree of Jesus. Let's look at the third lady. Her name is Ruth. I'm hurrying. The most significant point about Ruth, probably uh, from this standpoint, was that she was not a Jew. She was from Moab. Takes us back to Genesis 19. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah just a little bit earlier before we went live. But on that day, Lot escaped Sodom, his wife, uh, and his two daughters. His wife looked back, though, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. But Lot and his daughters, they found refuge in a cave. His daughters had been badly affected by their time in Sodom because they conspired to lure their father into sleeping with them. And on successive nights, they got Lot drunk and they slept with him. Both sisters got pregnant. They gave birth to sons, one named Moab, the other named Ammon. And these two boys, born of incest, they grew up to found nations that would eventually become both incredibly evil as well as bitter enemies of Israel. The Jews hated the Moabites and the Ammonites, Ammonites, uh, and they wanted nothing to do with them. So the book of Ruth, which bear her, bears her name, it tells of the romance that blossomed between Ruth the Moabitess and a man named Boaz, the Israelite. And they were a very unlikely couple. But in God's providence, they were brought together in marriage. They had a son named Obed. He had a son named Jesse. He had a son named David. Making Ruth David's great-grandmother. And that's how a person from the hated nation of Moab entered into the line of the Messiah. What an interesting thought that is. And um, th through the through the kinsman redeemed, yeah, is what Brother Taylor said, yeah. And uh, to think, though, that for Israelites, because they couldn't stand Moabites, and to think, though, that someone from that bloodline would have creeped on in. What is, is there an importance behind that, in your opinion? Go ahead, Brother Taylor. Is there an importance, the fact that now we have someone from another bloodline in the in the, in the bloodline of the messiah go ahead brother taylor well if you go back and you begin to read through all of the kings it's just like over and over and over and they did evil in the sight of the lord and they did evil in the sight of the lord and they did evil in the sight of the lord and he told them said you don't marry outside of your nation oh so, as they did evil of course they did they married other people yeah. but then you see Jesus with the woman at the well. That was a Gentile. Moabites was a Gentile. And so the, eventually the door is open to the Gentile nation exactly. because the Jewish nation was, was rejected by Christ. And so the Gentile nation was also were grafted in as a Jewish nation because us uh, Gentiles and she was a Gentile that made it into the of Christ. And, and it probably is the most important part of Matthew chapter 1. It really is. Ruth is probably the most important part of Matthew chapter 1 because of what Brother Taylor just said. It now allowed the Gentiles to be grafted in. Meaning, hello, that's us. We don't have to be of Jewish background now to be in the bloodline of Christ. Uh, now Gentiles were in that bloodline as well, and that's us. And thank God for that, right? Let's talk about one more because we've already went over time tonight, and I want to be respectful of your time tonight. So the last woman in some versions of the Bible is not mentioned by name. In the NLT that I read you, she is mentioned as Bathsheba. But the way in the other versions that you know it is Bathsheba is because she is uh, recognized as the widow of um, Uriah, the widow of Uriah. And so the story, of course, you know, let me give it to those that may be watching tonight and aren't familiar with this. Uh, the story of Bathsheba's adultery with King David. It is so well known that a lot of people may not need it, need it repeated. But you understand that David uh, saw her showering on uh, the top of the roof. 
He tells his people, I want her, bring her to me. She's already married. So, of course, he puts her husband on the front lines because he knows what? He's going to get killed. So, uh, we can easily say that adultery was only the beginning of the relationship with David and Bathsheba. Um, Before the scandal was over, it included lying. It included a royal cover-up. And ultimately murder. So as a result, go ahead, Sister Joe. <coughs> and the baby was, the baby was, yes. And uh, that's where I was going to head there. As a result, the child conceived that night, died soon after birth. And then David's family and empire began to crumble. Now we know eventually David married Bathsheba. They had another son by the name of Solomon, who be, who was the wisest, the Bible tells us, the wisest man that ever lived, right? So quite a result for a union that began in adultery. It really is. So there's dirt all over this episode. Uh, but don't miss the main point that I want you to see tonight as, as we uh, wrap this up. Bathsheba still made the list. She's still mentioned in that Matthew chapter 1. The whole reason we started this study two weeks ago was because I, I was hoping to help you to see some stories about Christmas that get overlooked. We all know about the manger. We all know about the angel. We all know about Gabriel. Uh, we all know about, uh, uh, about Mary, the Virgin Mary. We all know uh, the stories. But a lot of people skip Matthew chapter 1, and it's probably one of the most beautiful. If you keep on reading past where we stopped today, probably verses 18, 19, somewhere in there, it goes on to tell you uh, the Christmas story. And this is one of the most important things about the Christmas story. Because what does it tell us? It tells us that we can belong to the kingdom of God. Okay? We can. No matter what your past, no matter. It tells us that Jesus was born for all of us. And that even if there were some unsavory characters in his background, that still didn't stop the plan that God had for his life. So let's transpose that onto ourselves. Maybe you have some unsavory characters in your background. Maybe you have a family tradition that's not one that you're proud of. But the good news is, you don't have to stay there. Amen? These were four unlikely women. Tamar, who had incest, immorality, prostitution, and a Gentile. Rahab, who was a harlot. She lied. She was deceptive. She was a Canaanite. Ruth. A woman from Moab, which was a nation born out of incest. Bathsheba, adultery. Four unlikely women. Three of them were Gentiles. Three of them involved in some form of sexual immorality. Two of them involved in prostitution. One of them was an adulteress. But all four were in the line that leads to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's amazing. So why would God include women like this on the list? It's not only the women, ladies, I'm not picking on you tonight. It's Abraham, it's Isaac, it's Jacob, it's David. They were sinners too. So why include people like that? Brother Taylor, please. Go right ahead. I believe we hear people and we we witness to people and they'll say, oh, I've been too bad for God to accept me. You don't know what I've done. Well, are you a liar? That's already in the family. Two, that's already in the family. Yeah. A deceiver, they're already in the family. A murderer, already in the family. We already got them. Because God forgives. And God still today forgives yeah. sin. When we are, are faithful and just to repent yeah. and accept God, he's faithful and just to forgive, to forgive us, us of us. every sin. To forgive us and cleanse us. Amen? Of all unrighteousness. Uh, what, what a great point and what a perfect way to end this. It just proves and it shows and it tells us and it, and it reinforces within us and it confirms within us that, hey, uh, this family's pretty messed up already. So adding another messed up person to it ain't going to hurt a thing, right? If somebody walks through that back door, maybe they're a drunkard. Guess what? We've already got drunkards in the family. Right? Maybe they've uh, experienced adultery in their life. Guess what? Been there, done that. Bought the t-shirt. 
And, and it's just a, a comforting thing to know. That the grace of God is good, amen? amen? And no matter what happens in life, we've already got it in this royal bloodline. And as Brother Taylor just said, if we're faithful to repent, right? He's going to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Praise God for that. Uh, Sister Martha said this just goes to show that God can work wonders with worldly people regardless. He can. He sure can. Um, all right. Any other comments tonight? We love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us online tonight. And thank you guys for joining us here in person. Uh, we appreciate you so much and are thankful for everything that you do uh, here at Bethel Church. We'll be, excuse me, I got to, you know, I don't want people to think I'm dying up here or something, but I've got to cough. Um, we are, uh, we're going to have a good day Sunday, so come on back and uh, uh, be ready for our Christmas party Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Everybody's welcome. Even if you don't attend church here, just sh shoot me a text and Come on in, 15 bucks, we're going to have barbecue catered in, and it's going to be a fun night. Love you so much. We'll be back here 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Sister Annette East will teach our discipleship class, and then uh, we'll have a wonderful time. We're going to have a special guest worship leader Sunday morning uh, because uh, a lot of our praise team uh, has prior commitments this weekend. So we're going to have a special guest uh, worship leader and a special guest drummer this weekend. So come on, be a part of it. It's going to be a great weekend. We love you. We're praying for you, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Amen. Mm -hmm.